Good morning, those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, live or down the road. For those of us here at Cornerstone, we welcome you and we're grateful that you've come. And uh, normally we pray for you on Facebook before we log on to Facebook. But we're going to pray with you today, right now, uh, that God would take this message and use this message in your life and our lives and the life of everyone who will ever hear it uh, down the road. As we, as we think about the reality, the title of this message is, I told you so. And the subtitle is that God can say this about the birth of Christ. He told us so many times before the birth happened. So let's pray together and ask him to speak to us on this last, Chris, on this last Sunday before Christmas of the end of 2020, what a year it's been, and let's trust him to, uh, to speak to all of our hearts. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this uh, time to be together. We thank you for your living word, uh, which speaks to us right now. We thank you that the story of Christ is the truth, and we thank you that our hope is in someone who's alive and someone who's returning. Help us as we finish this to make that clear. And again, as we come today, we pray that you'll uh, help give us ears to hear you. We don't need to ask you to speak clearly. We need to ask you for the grace for us to listen clearly. So help us listen clearly to you in a fresh way today. Thank you for the Christmas story. What an amazing story it is. We pray together in the name of the Christ of Christmas. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, this morning's message, as I just said, is called I Told You So. And I was thinking about when I heard someone tell me, I told you so. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? Uh, me, yeah, probably more times than we care to admit. Often, uh, if it's, especially if it's someone you don't really know that well, often when someone says, I told you so, it's with an air of arrogance or even uh, coming across as prideful or condescending, even dismissive. And, and, and I love it when someone prefaces, prefaces it by saying, I hate to be, and I told you so, because I want to cut them right off and say, well, apparently you don't really, you know, because I hate to be, and I told you so, but I told you so. And usually the I told you so is connected to something you should have heard that we didn't hear. And it's one thing to miss something that's not that important. It's another thing to miss something that's eternally important. And God has told us what we uh, need to know. If ever someone can say, I told you so perfectly, it's God. And the, the nativity narratives uh, 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 help us to understand that uh, God knows everything. He can tell us anything because he knows everything about anything. He's the only one who's able to uh, fall into that category. So again, uh, I told you so, God can say this about the birth of Jesus Christ. Here's the theme for this morning's message. It's that God foretold the details of Christ's birth centuries before he was born. This is an important thing for us as believers, and if you're not a believer yet, as you're, if you're a seeker, to really wrestle with. That, that long before it happened, God said it would happen, and he said specifically where it would happen, when it would happen, how it would happen. And what it truly meant. And so the application is keep remembering and celebrating the prophecies concerning our Savior's birth. Because the birth announcement was set out many times before he arrived. When, 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 when uh, people in our world get pregnant, they'll set out a birth announcement. We're expecting. And, and uh, they, they've already conceived, so there's uh, the expectation that that's exactly what's going to happen. Before the conception took place, God was able to say we're expecting and, and acknowledge that the, the, the implications of that are humongous. So not long after I became a Christian, I was playing the trumpet in a Christmas musical written by two of the pastors at the church I was at. And these pastors were musicians, but they, they, uh, they were staff pastors in other areas. But man, this was one of the best Christmas musicals I ever heard, ever had the privilege to play in. It was called On a Common Night. And the whole focus was about how completely uncommon the birth of Jesus was that night in Bethlehem to a common girl in a common place, on a common night, in a common way, a most uncommon birth took place. And so we celebrate that. And here we are this morning acknowledging this baby king. Uh, the wordless one, who was the word of God, had to learn how to speak. The, the little fingers and the, uh, the, the, the lips that would nurse from his mother, uh, as, a, as, as most newborns do, that all that accompanies a newborn human baby accompanied Jesus in his humanity, but this baby was 
different than any other baby who had ever been born because God the Father was the Father. And it's a mystery, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it calls us to wonder, but uh, again, the evidence is in, the details have been given, and it's uh, happened just as he said. So this morning's message is an invitation to once again acknowledge and embrace the fact that the birth of Jesus was foretold centuries before he arrived. So the first point for this morning's message is this. The arrival of Jesus happened first just as God said it would. Uh, if you turn back or turn to the book of Isaiah with me, the book of Isaiah, and, uh, and what, we'll, what, we'll, what we'll see clearly is that the, uh, again, this, 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 this was foretold, and Isaiah 7 is where we're going to look first, Isaiah chapter 7. Um, under the first point it says this, uh, again, the arrival of Jesus happened just as God said it would, and then under that first point, the one who inhabits eternity knows everything about everything. So he could tell us the way it will be, even before it was. And in Isaiah 7, 14, we hear the, the verse that, we find a verse that is uh, very well known by most of us who've heard the Messiah. Uh, and I won't sing it because I want you to stay with us here, but uh, here's what the verse says. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will be called Emmanuel. And, and so that's the first clear uh, or, or a clear specific reference, the first of the birth, uh, that it will be a virgin birth. And here's, I'll just make this point and then move, move on, but listen to what it says in that 14th verse. Therefore the Lord will give you a sign. What's a sign for? At the very least, A, to get your attention, and B, to give you information or direction. Maybe they're trying to get you to buy something and they want you to see their sign, so they're trying to inform you about the product and get you to, to respond to it. And when it comes to some signs, though every sign is meant to get your attention and communicate something to you, some signs are less significant than others. If you're on a long road trip and you're starting to feel hungry and there's all kinds of exits in front of you and you see a sign for Bob Evans on, you know, get off this exit, that's not as important as Chipotle. No, I'm kidding. If you see a sign that says Bob Evans or some certain restaurant, you can blow right by that, no big deal. But if, if you see a sign and you're going 70 miles an hour and it says traffic stop ahead, bridge out, you might want to take note. That's a little more important, but still it's just a sign. A sign will be given to you. God is, is wanting to grab your attention and wanting to tell you something very important. And one of the ways you'll know this is the Messiah is because it will be a virgin who gives birth to this baby boy. For and to us, uh, we'll, we'll see that in the next reference. Uh, a, a, a child is given, a son is born. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we celebrate that. Each of these prophecies, each of these passages give details again before they happen. A uh, little factoid for you to find great comfort in as a Christian, and if you're a seeker, here's a little factoid meant to get your attention. At least 351 times in the Old Testament, a prophecy was given concerning Christ, concerning his birth, concerning his earthly ministry, concerning uh, the way he would die. We see that in Psalm 22. It describes the crucifixion before crucifixion was even a part of any culture. It describes the way he would die, the resurrection. At least 351 Old Testament prophecies put a, put a spotlight on Christ before he even appeared. It's fascinating when you, when you acknowledge that and you can see that. So I, I just said a moment ago, turn with me just two chapters over to uh, Isaiah chapter 9. And it's in verses uh, 6 and 7 where we find these verses. We read them here at the beginning of our gathering at, uh, this morning. Uh, for, and you go earlier, for unto us a child is born. Straight from scripture, Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 6. six. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Mustafa, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And verse 7, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And 
And here's the, the key concerning this specific prophecy, but every prophecy, every promise God has made. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. It will transpire exactly the way he said it would. And it did transpire exactly the way he said it would. Because he's God. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And then uh, in Micah chapter 5, uh, turn to Micah chapter 5, uh, in, in the uh, Minor Prophet, uh, this is small print, and I'm not exactly sure where it is. It's right after. Where's it right after? Somebody help me. Obadiah. Micah, yes, it's right after Obadiah. It's right after Jonah. I'm sorry, if you have a very small print Bible, you're in trouble. Uh, it's right after Jonah, the book of Micah. And so in this, when they're called the minor prophets, not because they don't have a punch to their message, it's just because they're shorter uh, books, uh, fewer chapters. And so it's in Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, that we uh, read uh, this uh, prophecy. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, and, the, and this is the prophecy concerning the birthplace, and it's connected to being in the house of the lineage of David, that, that that's why Mary and Joseph, when she's not, you know, close to the end of her pregnancy, ready to deliver, they make this somewhere around 90 mile trip over the land to Bethlehem. And this is here in Micah chapter 5, and we see it in verse 2. But you, Bethlehem and Capitol, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. We will raise, we will raise against them seven shepherds, even eight commanders. And then he goes on to describe more of what will happen as this conflict takes place. But clearly we see him being referred to as the shepherd, right? And the, and the one who will rule and reign. And so it's a, it's a, it's a direct uh, uh, prediction slash promise slash prophecy concerning the arrival of Christ and, and what, will, uh, what will take place. And then last but not least, if you flip back to Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 23 and verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Uh, we find these words concerning the arrival of Jesus happening. Just as God said, it would happen. The days are coming, Jeremiah 23, verse 5. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David's uh, raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteous Savior. So Jeremiah, well, the, the order we just heard was Isaiah, Micah, and Jeremiah. All three of these Old Testament prophet, prophets were given this clear direction by God as they prophesied concerning the birth of Jesus. And um, again, the story of Christ's birth can be summed up this way. Long before it happened, God said it would happen, and he gave us specific details about how we would know. And I, if nothing else, I would commend all of us to, to, to simply go back to, as, as, a, as, a, as a first order of, of, of embracing this, to that verse in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, because that is the one upon which everything rises or falls. We've talked about this in the last few weeks. It's part of the mystery and the, and the, the beauty of, of the message of this Messiah that never in the history of humanity has a virgin got pregnant. It is physically impossible for a virgin to get pregnant, to conceive and give birth. It's physically impossible. 
Because in order for the for the uh, conception to take place, the virginity has to leave. But here at this one time, when this virgin conceived and gave birth to a son, and as Isaiah says in that 14th verse, a sign will be given to you. Are you looking for God? <clears throat> here's, the, here's a sign. One of many he's given along the way, but this is arguably one of, if not the biggest, concerning the one who the Father sent and the one who came to save us. And the whole, the whole message that we as, as, as believers and anyone who's seeking, we, we need to be sure to, to really wrestle with and embrace and, and understand to the degree that we can. And then to run with this message, the old hymn book, Tower of the Mountain. Jesus is the only hope for every human to be fully alive and to be in heaven. There's no way to be fully alive or, or to be in heaven when this life is over without Jesus. He's it. And that's why he's either a magnetic man or just a, a repulsive message to you. Uh, if someone's dead set against him. He came to the world to love us, to save us, to free us, to forgive us, and he was murdered. Now why, how can that be? It's because some people are enemies of God. But if you're truly seeking, if you truly desire to know, God has given you this sign. And you can believe and you can be saved. But the only way that that can ever happen is in and through Jesus himself. Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. Jesus who was born in Bethlehem. Jesus whose mother was Mary. Again, had to be over there. I remember when we went, I don't remember what day of the week it was when we went to Bethlehem. But I remember when we got to Bethlehem. And it was like, seriously. This is Bethlehem? Because even today, with all that's happened since the birth of Christ and, and it being built up, even, even in that sense, it's like, uh, nothing to write home about, but it's something to shout to the world about. Even if you don't write home about Bethlehem, tiny little city. And yet, that's where Jesus was to his first breath in the plan. Magnificent story. So, um, this past Thursday, I shared with a, a friend that, that this... Uh, this musical called Child of the Promise. I highly recommend it. Um, you can find it, Child of the Promise, Michael Stromy Morgan. This opening overture, the title of it is, and I said this earlier, That's the Way It Will Be. And what this overture to this entire musical is, is they start out with trumpets. Uh, and, and, and then Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, and then back to Isaiah sing their messianic prophecies. It's, it's, it's wonderfully written. The music is beautiful, full orchestration. And, and so Isaiah and Micah and Jeremiah sing the messianic prophecies that God gave to them. Uh, Michael Morgan put it to uh, melody and, and music. Fascinating. And then the, here's, the, here's the recurring chorus. So Isaiah sings his first prophecy, you hear these words. Uh, Micah sings the prophecy out of the old Bethlehem. You hear these words, and then Jeremiah, the branch of righteousness and liberty. He'll, his, he'll perform his judgments perfectly from Jeremiah. And then this chorus repeats, and this is how it ends. Here's the chorus to that song. That's the way it will be. That's the way it will be. This is how it will go. Even if you don't believe me, watch the hand of God and see. Seek him, and you will know. Seek him, and you will know. And that is a statement to every human being on the planet. Even if you don't believe this, look at these prophecies centuries before the birth of Christ. And again, the biggie of the virgin birth there in Isaiah chapter 7. That's the way it will be. This is how it will go. Even if you don't believe me, watch the hand of God and see. Seek him. And you will find. Seek him, and you will find. You can take that to the bank. You can build a bank on that. It's the truth. And so the first point again is the arrival of Jesus happened just as God said it would. And the second and last point this morning is this. The arrival of Jesus happened. Uh, the, the arrival of Jesus happened, the way he, it, it happened, tells us. What's yet to be, will be, just as God said it would be. Let me say that again. 
the arrival of Jesus, the way Jesus arrived, and the prophecies that were fulfilled, all that tells us what's yet to be, will be, just as God has said it will be. God in his infinite wisdom, uh, for reasons only he knows, allowed all of us who are here today and listening today and will ever hear this and more on the planet at this point in history to be alive, uh, you know, to... To, uh, 2,000 plus years past the arrival of Christ. That God, that, that we live on this side of the incarnation, of the life, of the death, of the, of the burial, of the resurrection, and of the ascension of Jesus. All the things that God said would happen concerning Jesus, concerning those realities, his existence, his death, the way he died, why he died, what he accomplished, being buried, a corpse in the in the in the, the grave, rose on the third day, appeared for forty days, once to five hundred people at the same time, uh, evidence for a courtroom if you want, and then he ascended into heaven. So now everything the Bible says about everything after that that hasn't happened yet is going to happen exactly the way God said it will, right? And of course, the big thing is his return. And so as we, as we come to the, uh, you know, not just the end of this message, but to the end of this year, and to the opportunity to celebrate the, the birth of Christ again at this Christmas season, this is very, very important. That, that the arrival of Jesus happened the way God said it would, which tells us what's yet to be, will be, just as God said it will be. Under the second point, it says, as sure as Christ came, just as God said he would, he will return, just as God says he will. It's going to happen. And so many of the scriptures say it's going to take a lot of people, it's going to take, it's going to take people by surprise, most people by surprise. And there's parables about it, the foolish virgins and the oil, um, the, uh, the, 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 the guy who got money to build three more towers. So either Jesus is going to return or you're going to die and go, and go into eternity. One of those two things is going to happen next. But the reality is, and we'll see this, well, let's look at these passages. And again, I'll just say this before we look at them and conclude. This is where we plant our feet and rest in the wonder of the one who is the 100% perfect expression of promises made, promises kept. Has God ever made a promise he didn't keep? No. All these prophecies were promises kept. That's again, in a nutshell, what, Christ, what the Christmas story is. God made a bunch of promises, he kept every single one. And the promises that he's made, the promises that he's made concerning things that haven't happened yet, hey, you can, uh, I'm not a betting man, but you can bet your bottom dollar if you want, go all in. He's going to keep every promise about what hasn't happened yet, that he said is going to happen, right? And so with that, and it does, it, it brings an ongoing sense of wonder, but a, but a wonderful sense of confidence. He can be trusted. He's never lied. He never will. Ever. And so, listen to these verses. Acts, uh, turn, turn with me. I, this is, I alluded to this a moment ago. Acts, uh, right after the book of John. I'm sorry, yes, right after the book of John. Right before the book of Romans, you find the book of Acts. And uh, it's in Acts chapter 1 that I'd like us to turn and see in verses 10 and 11. And so this is, this is after Jesus has appeared. He's with the disciples. Uh, they're still not understanding it. You'll see that as you read the verses before this. Hopefully you'll do that uh, so they gathered, gathered uh, around Jesus in verse 8, Lord, are you the, at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And then it's in, in verses uh, 10 and 11 that we, we read this from Luke. Luke is the one who wrote the book of Acts. Uh, the human who was led by God, or who, who penned the book of Acts. Uh, verse 10. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly, so Jesus, this is the ascension. Um, after, the, after he said this, verse 9, yeah, I meant to say, let's look at verse 9. He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. We mentioned this not that long ago. All we can do is speculate. Was it, was it a really fast ascension, or was it really slow? We don't know. I, I would prefer that it was slow, like, you know, uh, the, he's just lifting off the ground. Gravity's not holding him anymore. However it was, he ascended, and then, it's, and then it says clouds. Either he went through the clouds, or clouds were brought in between him and them. So he couldn't, they couldn't see him anymore, but he ascended into the sky. And it's verse 10. 
They were looking up and telling him to the, the, to the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood before them. What does that remind you of? The, the day they found the two men, the angels that were there. Here's what the angels said. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Here's the promise. This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. What's that called? A promise. Slash prophecy. This is how it's going to be. He's going to return. And the same way you saw him leave it, the same way you can see him come. And the other passages talk about the sky splitting from the east to the west and him descending. And, and everybody will know. It, it will be a sign that nobody misses at that point. Though the sign of his virgin birth has been bypassed by many, many, many over the centuries. This is a sign everybody will see. And he will come back that same way. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, I love this passage because as I get closer and closer to being the focus of my own funeral, that's not a morbid thought, it's just a truth statement. Um, as, as we all get older, uh, I, I've shared this passage uh, at the, at the uh, funerals for, for those who, 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 uh, who have, you know, who know the Lord, who have trusted Christ. And uh, obviously it's written to the Thessalonians. Yeah, right before Timothy. And it's First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. It doesn't say you don't grieve. It says you don't grieve without any hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead of Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. So the same way that Jesus ascended, and it goes on to say in the next verse, therefore comfort one another with these words, very important. I talk about comfort in the face of physical death. They're just sleeping. They're asleep in death. Everybody wakes up after they fall asleep. And uh, the, the, the promise here is that this is how this is how it's going to be. He's going to come, and then the dead of Christ will go first, and then those of us who are still alive, maybe, maybe we're part of that generation today. We'll find out, won't we? When it happens, not if, but when it happens, because God's promised it, then we will ascend to be and be him with him in the air. Some kind of transformation will take place. And, and then, don't you just love the end of that 17th verse? And, and then we will be with the Lord forever. Amen. It's going to happen. As sure as the birth day, this is going to happen. He's going to come back. What did he say in John 14? Don't let your hearts be troubled. I go to what? Prepare a place for you. I'm going to go. I'm going to do something. I'm going to come back. I'm going to get you. I'm going to take you there. We're going to be there forever. That's what it says, right? Such good news. Such hope. And then uh, I'll just reference that. I guess I'll read the, the whole thing. Revelation chapter 21. Again, another another verse. Uh, this uh, the Revelation of John on the Isle of Patmos and how this most of the book of Revelation is, is imagery and and, and yet, when you get to verse 20, or chapter 21, it's very, very clear and very, very te detailed. This isn't imagery. This isn't, uh, this, this is clear what, what he says. Starting with verse 1 of chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! Or behold, or check this out, however you want to, it's like, I, let's get your attention. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. 
He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are faithful and true. Promises. I love saying this in funerals for those who, who have been alive in Christ when their body died. God himself will wipe your tears away. He's not going to delegate. He's not going to appoint a tear wiping committee on his behalf. God himself will wipe the final tears from your eyes because there'll be none now. Isn't that comforting? It's going to happen just like he said. And that's the whole point of the second point. That what hasn't happened yet, that God said it was going to happen a certain way, is going to happen that exact way. That's exactly how it's going to go down. Because God said it would. So, uh, those verses, uh, the, 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 the confidence that comes. Um, as we celebrate Christmas each year, and I'll end with this, as we celebrate Christmas each year, the reality is that one Christmas will be the last Christmas for everyone. For some of us, this may be our last Christmas individually. That may be the case. Maybe we won't be alive 365 days from today. Maybe. God knows. It's all in His hands. Our lives are in His hands. He's never heard of it. But there will be one Christmas that's the final Christmas for every person on the planet. Because all of this will have happened. And this could be the one. It could be. The stage is set. I'm not a expert on eschatology, and I know there are people who disagree and say, oh, these certain things have to happen. The biggest thing in Matthew is where he says this gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth, and then the end will come. It's made it to the ends of the earth. There are still languages being translated, and now with apps, they're being translated much, much quicker. People are hearing the gospel in their own tongue. The last, one day, the last person who's going to hear the gospel and respond to it will hear it and respond to it, and it's over. And one of those Christmases will be the last one for everybody on the planet. Maybe this Christmas, maybe a hundred Christmases from now. Time is not to us the way it is to God. One day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day, right? But the fact remains that one Christmas on earth will be the last Christmas on this earth. Because this earth is going to be cast into fire and destroyed. And can, as Revelation 21 says, there will be a new heaven and a new earth where there is no death where there isn't even a hint of sin ever having been. And that's a promise from God. And we can celebrate that, and we should. So I'll, I'll end with, a, with another musical. I started with the one called On a Common Night that I played at as a baby Christian up in, up in Willoughby Hills. Uh, there's another musical I heard at a church here locally several years ago, heard by a guy named Greg Ferguson from uh, Oak Creek Community Church when things were going better there. He wrote this musical called You Write the Ending. And the whole point of the musical was this. That you've heard this story. You've heard the news. And, 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 this, and, the, and the, the sense of, and even in the musical, this, this opportunity was given. Basically, the whole musical set the stage for this moment. Your move. You get that? You're moved. You've heard all this? And you're believing all this? Have you ever responded to all this? It's one thing, it's one thing to say, will you marry me? It's another thing to get married. And it's one thing to say, I believe all this. I believe he's God. But again, the difference until you and I, and that's the last verse I'll just, I'll just reference. It's in John. Let's look there, and then we will really will be free. The Gospel of John, um, in the very first chapter, uh, the very first verse resonates with every uh, person who knows their Old Testament, which were the readers of the Gospels. In the beginning, every good every good Jewish believer would think God created heaven and the earth. And John says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God." And then you got down to that. Well, let me read verses 9 through 12. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. The true light, the, not a, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children. 
children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And then this is a, one of the most familiar verses for at, at the, the Christmas story, the Christmas cards, uh, everywhere you turn. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This Jesus is who everyone needs to know. Because that's eternal life. Not about him, not an awareness of, but a relationship with. And if you haven't established that, this is the time to do that. Again, your move. If you're super, 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 super hungry, and somebody either brings you a very good, nutritious meal, or gives you 20 bucks to say, go find whatever you want, you think you're not gonna do anything? You're gonna have to take that money and go buy next meal? You're not gonna take that food and eat it if you're really, really hungry? And you get to the point where you realize, I, I need to be saved, I need a savior. Well, here he is. He really did come, he really did live, he really did die, he really did rise again, and he really is returning. And God wants to bring you into his story, which is that story, the story of redemption. Undoing and redoing and making right everything that God found done in Genesis chapter 3. Born separated from God, come to a relationship with God. Live forever. The greatest gift you can receive this Christmas, if you're not a Christian yet, is Christ. That's the greatest gift you could receive. Because it will take you through forever. Most of the gifts people give you, 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 you know, you go to some of these department stores on the 26th and 27th, and they have more returns than there are people buying, right? Well, this is a gift you will never want to return, and you, and you won't once you receive it. And so, what is yet to happen is what is going to happen, and uh, receiving Him, uh, your move is what we're, is, is uh, you know, the, the, again, the greatest gift that's ever been given, has already been given. It's ours to receive, and that's what it says in that uh, in that um, um, uh, twelfth verse. Yet to all who did receive him, not just nod at him, or not just acknowledge him, or not just say, "Wow, he's interesting," but to those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right. And what is his name? What did what did the angel tell Joseph to name Jesus? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> What did Joseph, what did the angel tell Joseph to name Mary's son? Right? Jesus, because what? He will save his people from their sins. He's come to save us, forgive us, free us, love us, bring us to heaven with himself. So that's our prayer for all of us this morning that we would, for those of us who have received that gift, that we would live it. For those of you that haven't received that gift yet, that you would get it and believe. Even now, even today, even as we pray, that you would find yourself turning to Christ and, and receiving him into your life, welcoming him, believing he's the only one who can give you life on this side of the grave and bring you into life, eternal life, on the other side. And he'll give you eternal life right now. Well, here's the making it real questions. They were pretty simple this morning, huh? Just as the arrival of Jesus happened, just as God said it would. How comforting is this? That's the first question. And then the second point is the arrival of Jesus happened as God said it would, which tells us what's yet to be will be just as God said it would be. How comforting is this? Same question for both points. How comforting is this? You and I can trust God. That's the bottom line. He can be trusted. And by his grace, we'll do that. And here's the action step. I've shared this on social media a couple times this last couple weeks. If you haven't seen it there or you're hearing this for the first time, you hear it. Please, uh, on Christmas Eve, I'm going to do a Facebook Live at, at uh, 4 o'clock. And I'm going to reference this then because I want as many people who know me to know this, to do this, and see this, and be blessed. Highly hope you'll take this action step. Go to YouTube to find and watch The Shepherd, which is the pilot for The Chosen, which is a recent TV series on the life of Christ. It sums up this morning's message in a most superb way. It's called The Shepherd. I believe it's 21 minutes long. And here's how it ends. And I'm going to give you the, the ending of what I'm going to share on Christmas Eve. Here's how it ends. The one shepherd who limps, who has a blemished lamb, who's thrown out of the, the, uh, the city, 
because you can't have a blemished lamb to bring for an offering. And uh, at the very end of it, he's one of the shepherds who's out in the field when the angels, it's like it's really well done, really well produced, no cheesy dialogue, it's just a great production. And these angels just appear to these shepherds. They'd never seen that. They were overwhelmed. And they ran to Bethlehem. They ran. And they get there. And this guy who's the, 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 the one who limps from some kind of deformity, he actually, he actually trips and tears up his arm and it's all bloody. You'll see how this all fits together. They all come into where Jesus is. Earlier in the, in the, in the movie, as uh, Joseph and Mary are making their way into Bethlehem, that shepherd and Joseph and Mary cross paths. And this shepherd had no idea that it was Joseph and Mary and that was the Messiah inside of her. And she was thirsty and he gave her some water. And then he sees her again in the stall. And, the, and Joseph recognizes him and says, come on over. It's very, it's very, very powerful. And, and when he gets close to Joseph, he looks at Joseph and, and is almost weeping. And he says, Because he had read Isaiah 7, 14. He had read Isaiah 9. We have been waiting, and, and the implication is we haven't been waiting for this so long, we've been waiting for him so long. So again, we're all here to tell you he's already been here. Now what we need to do is find him and follow him in a different way than they did, but in a real life-giving way like they did. And let's pray to that. Father God, Thank you again for your word. Thank you for the wonder of the story of Christmas. We, we elevate and celebrate the Christ of Christmas even now. We pray for any of us here or anybody listening who has not yet believed and not yet received Jesus as their Savior, as the one who will give them life, that somehow by your Spirit, this day, this season, this would be it. You help all of us who need to make that move still hear it by your spirit, your move. I sent my son to save you. Now what are you going to do? We thank you, God, that you say that with love and compassion and mercy and grace and kindness. You say, come to me and I will give you life. We pray that many, even through this simple message, will do that very thing better than any gift that can be bought or given or received in a store or made by us. It is you, Father in heaven, giving your son who is the giver of life to us. So we thank you. We do pray, God, that as we look to you again today, we, we, we acknowledge with gratitude that you're who you say you are. You've done what you said you were going to do, and you will do what you say is yet to happen. We trust you. We trust you. There's nobody else we can turn to for matters like this. Strengthen us today to celebrate the birth of your Son, our Savior, with the freedom and joy that honors the reality and the significance of what you did because of who he is. We acknowledge that for unto us a child was born and a son was given. For us, Again, we thank you that by your grace, and we ask you that by your grace, our lives will tell your story as Christ lives in us and leads us. We are grateful for the greatest gift that was given to all of humanity that day in Bethlehem. Thank you, God. Help each one of us to always be true to you, the one who is always true to us. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Now go, be tellers of this good news, and bearers of this true light. Keep seeking. Keep celebrating. Keep pressing on until that final day. Grace and peace, God be with you. Have a merry Christmas. <laughs>